Coming up, to prepare for my C1 examination in French this spring, I've been watching a lot of French TV. And this week, I saw a brilliant report about the UK four years after Brexit on the Franco-German channel Arte. I thought subscribers to Truth to Power would find it fascinating to get an objective insight into four years of Brexit from a French-speaking news outlet without any UK political skin in the game. Stay tuned. The Arte report starts with Boris Johnson's duplicitous welcome to the start of Brexit. This is the moment when the dawn breaks and the curtain goes up on a new act in our great national drama. Now is the time to make better the lives of everyone in every corner of our United Kingdom. Four years later, the Arte presenter, Elizabeth Quinn, asks whether Brexit has truly fulfilled its promises of better days. She says that some economists assert that the country is holding up fairly well, but that others present a grim picture with figures. Brexit has reportedly cost 163 billion euros and resulted in the loss of 2 million jobs. Only 22% of Britain's believe, according to a recent survey, that leaving the EU has had a positive effect. So this, enchantment fait écho aux manifestations des europhiles. this disillusionment echoes the demonstrations of europhiles who continue to voice their opinions, and the video shows two of those pro-EU voices from the Rejoin March last autumn. The people of the UK know we were lied to, deceived and taken for a ride. Le monde entier doit le savoir. The whole world must know. Nous finirons par réintégrer l'UE, parce que Brexit est un désastre. We will eventually rejoin the EU because Brexit is a disaster. So, Elizabeth Quinn asks, four years on, what's the verdict on Brexit? A success story or a bad trick? Her co-host gives the statement of the day. The UK hasn't experienced the promised trade benefits, according to the British Chamber of Commerce, a failure for an overwhelming majority of surveyed entrepreneurs, including those who were pro-Brexit. Among all Britons, two-thirds believe that leaving the European Union has fueled inflation and reduced purchasing power, with only one in ten believing that Brexit has been beneficial to them. The co-host puts this to Jeremy Stubbs, president of the British Conservatives in Paris. I would respond with just one word. Floxy nauki nihil pilification. Yes, I had to look that word up myself, but it's just a very Brexity way of saying being pointless or worthless. Mm -hmm. To be able to say it's been a disaster, we must wait a bit longer, as new import controls are starting this year. We'll see if there's a dramatic change. Those in favour of Brexit say, but at least we have sovereignty now. And I love this sarcastic look on Stubbs' face as he says that. He's clearly not happy with how Brexit has gone. The presenter then turns to Stephanie Villers, economic advisor from PricewaterhouseCoopers, asking, does sovereignty really offset the economic figures, which are quite bad? Last year, UK inflation was around 8%, almost double that of France. Like us, Villers says, Britain faced a health crisis and an energy crisis, but Brexit adds additional costs. Even if there are no customs duties with the European Union, all the administrative formalities come at an additional cost. Toutes les formalités administratives, c'est un coût, et donc ça a fait que bah, la facture a augmenté, d'autant que euh, ils dépendent. The UK depends on imports for energy, like us, but also for their food. 40% of UK food comes from imports, and we've seen food prices soar. Il n'y a pas de bonnes nouvelles euh, suite, en tout cas, huit mm -hmm. ans après. So there's no good news following the Brexit referendum, even eight years later. The British are paying a heavy price for this political decision. Les Britanniques. Euh, Pay un, un lourd tribut, hein, cette décision politique. The presenter cuts in saying the British see it in their daily lives, for example, with shortages in supermarkets. He then turns to Yves Bertoncini, an expert in European business. Leaving the EU wasn't like breaking out of prison. They were allowed to leave, with regret sometimes. But to say divorce comes without a cost is simply nonsense. Un divorce est coûteux. It was an expensive divorce in the short term, compounded by the shock of the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
On peut toujours rêver, ils peuvent toujours rêver qu'en refaisant leur vie plus They might dream that maybe in 5 or 10 years things will get better, but a divorce from the EU is costly because after all, the EU was the UK's main trading partner due particularly to its geographical proximity. Du Royaume-Uni compte tenu de la proximité géographique Quinn says, and speaking of nonsense, there were lies spread about Brexit during the campaign, particularly by the Brexit side. And this is the subject of the archive she's about to show. Le camp des pro-Europe est toujours sous le choc. The pro-Europe camp is still in shock, grieving. This woman says... Je crois que les gens ne savent pas pourquoi ils ont voté. Many people voté. aren't really sure why they voted the way they did, as the referendum was built on lies. Even one of the leading Brexit figures has admitted this. During the campaign, they claimed on their buses that the £350 million sent to the EU each week would go to the British healthcare system, a promise that was ridiculous. When asked whether the £350 million we sent to the EU every week will be used to improve our social services. Even nationalist leader Nigel Farage admitted no, je ne peux pas le garantir. no, I can't guarantee that and I won't make that kind of statement anymore. It's one of the mistakes of our campaign. Une des de notre campagne. Quinn points out that this admission came just three days after the referendum. Conservative Jeremy Stubbs then argues that there were lies on both sides and that everyone knew that the figure on the bus was a lie at the time, but that the Remain camp failed to tackle it in their minds. Marketing and communication. On peut se demander pourquoi ce mensonge que tout le monde a déclaré un mensonge à l'époque n'a pas mieux marché en faveur de Remain, de la campagne pour rester. Oui. Actually, that's a fair comment. The co-host then asks Stephanie Villay if the new Brexit controls on imports that came into effect this week after multiple delays could realistically worsen the situation. Yes, Villay's replies. Any control on fruits, vegetables, flowers and so on means that delivery will take longer. Rappelez combien les Britanniques importent. 27% des produits alimentaires sont importés. Remember how much the UK imports. 27% of its food comes from the EU and over Overall, 40% of UK food is imported. The UK is dependent on imports for its food supply. Now, they've limited the easy access they once enjoyed because of the new Brexit regulations. Aujourd'hui, en fait, ils se limitent cette cette fluidité. The EU doesn't suffer nearly as much in terms of imports and exports as the UK represents a much smaller proportion of overall EU trade. Pour l'Union européenne, pour en termes de de d'importation et so the UK also faces additional Brexit red tape, rather than the promise of taking back control from what was presented as excessive EU regulations. Quinn adds, the UK has doubled sanitary controls and regulations. Yes, Villers adds, which is somewhat shooting themselves in the foot and which won't help food inflation rates, which are affecting British households' purchasing power. The male co-host then turns to Burton Cheney, who says that c'est un affaiblissement, voilà, un affaiblissement du Royaume-Uni relatif. It's a relative weakening of the UK, a bad choice that Britons may regret, even if they haven't all changed their minds quite yet. The co-host interjects to say that this may change because a divorce can take time and it's only been four years. Perhaps in France they haven't quite yet seen the last few years of UK polling showing a two-to-one majority in the UK now thinking Brexit was a bad idea. But Bertoncini continues. Du continent, c'est un poison lent, le Brexit. On en a masqué les effets d'une certaine mm. manière. Avec la Brexit is a slow poison, and its effects were somewhat masked by the pandemic and the Russian invasion. Without these crises, the pure toxic effects of leaving the EU might have been more evident. Et moins engagé, et ça reste coûteux de sortir. Maintenant, c'est possible, la preuve. Mais les accords de libre échange, vous les évoquez pas C'est un plus. Elizabeth Quinn then asks if all the new trade agreements aren't a positive side of Brexit, despite everything, and turns to Stubbs again. Stubbs says that the free trade agreements talked about as a positive aspect of Brexit don't compensate for what was lost with the EU. He says efforts have been made to offset the loss from the EU trade agreement, but the goal has been to maintain the status quo rather than gain any new advantages. See. Quelqu'un avait bien géré la sortie. If someone had managed the exit properly and without the complications of the Ukraine situation and the pandemic, things might indeed have been different. But that's hypothetical. Tout à fait. Mais bon, oui. c'est le contrefactuel. I'm warming to this guy. Est-ce que euh, le Royaume-Uni peut encore devenir 
de Singapour de l'Europe. The male co-host then asked whether the UK can still become the Singapore of Europe as it dreamed of being. Villers states that the short-term outlook isn't very promising. Alors, à très court terme, pour avoir une fiscalité euh, euh, avantageuse, il faut ne pas avoir besoin de recettes. Post-pandemic and energy crisis, public finances are strained because, like many countries, the UK supported its population and businesses through the pandemic. Therefore, they don't have the leeway to significantly lower taxes de faire euh, main basse sur, sur les impôts. Donc ils n'ont besoin de... They need the revenue. The female co-host then says that that's especially true considering the reported tens of billions of pounds that Brexit has cost. Yes, agrees Villers. But what's more concerning is the stance of businesses. Le positionnement des entreprises. Household consumption might be curbed by inflation temporarily, but since the initiation of Brexit in 2016, British companies have been hesitant to invest. Investment is crucial for future growth and employment, she argues, and there's been a noticeable dip in UK investment since Brexit. Even traditionally pessimistic French companies have continued to invest, gaining an edge over their British counterparts, as have German businesses. The fact that UK investment levels have remained stagnant ever since the referendum in 2016 is alarming. The level of investment of the British is resté au même niveau que 2016, it's très important. The panel then spent quite a few minutes covering the subject of illegal immigration, which I'll just touch on in this video. Their conclusion was that the controversial Rwanda immigration plan, already rejected by the Supreme Court and pending further parliamentary review, doesn't really represent a clear win for Brexiteers in managing illegal immigration. L'effet que ça peut avoir est avant les élections prochaines est, est, est minimal. And that while there's been a lot of talk about illegal immigration, it's actually legal immigration that has surged to record highs, with around six to seven hundred thousand people largely coming in to address labour shortages due to Brexit. Mille personnes. Bertoncini makes the point that one tangible consequence of Brexit was ending the free movement of people within the EU, meaning citizens from countries like Poland, Romania and France can no longer easily move to the UK for work. Mais moyen en quoi Moyen en quoi ben les Britanniques se sont rendus compte qu'il manquait de main-d'œuvre et donc il a fallu en faire venir de manière légale. This has led to a realization of labor shortages in the UK, necessitating legal immigration to fill the gap and hence the high numbers of legal immigrants with visas. Il y avait déjà le contrôle de leurs frontières, il n'était pas dans Schengen. The UK already had control over its borders as it wasn't part of the Schengen area, but combating illegal immigration remains challenging. While there have been some successes in cooperation with France and agreements with Albania and Rwanda, these measures have somewhat tarnished the UK's image and standing in the world. There's been a long discussion about the far-right parties in Europe and the future of the EU, and a lot of that isn't really to do with Brexit, although some of it is, but I'll skip over it to a certain extent. Let's pick up with the co-host who says that the notion of sovereignty is indeed popular within the EU, whether in economic terms or in managing immigration. In the same time, there's this notion of sovereignty, and it's true that today, it's time en vogue de, dans l'Union européenne, que ce soit économiquement ou sur la gestion de l'immigration. Villers says that sovereignty in areas like food and technology is actually crucial, especially when facing competition from China and the US. It's clear, she says, that if we're to have any leverage, it must be within the context of Europe. The financial resources needed to compete with American businesses, for example, can only be found at the European level. Countries like Germany, France, Italy and everyone else are well aware that alone they cannot stand against this global competition. The Brexit cult thought that plucky little Britain could compete with the Chinese and American superpowers all by themselves. And seeing the ridiculousness of Brexit, the male co-host points out, Marine Le Pen is no longer in favour of a French Brexit or a Frexit. Bertoncini then adds that if we choose to believe her, she is indeed no longer europhobic and doesn't want to leave, but that she wants to stay and try to transform the EU from within. De l'intérieur, l'Union Européenne. He calls this l'un des héritages empoisonnés du Brexit. L'un des héritages empoisonnés du Brexit a reflection of a broader trend where outright europhobia is less openly expressed due to Brexit serving as the deterrent for others. So in conclusion, there are benefits to Brexit. They just all happen to be for the future of the European Union.